Order! 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 You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And the, p the story of the front page is, is indeed two stories. It's Pippa and politics. Pippa, politics, Tory wobble on the front page of the Sunday Times. Auntie Pippa, politics, an interview on the, in the Sunday Telegraph with Theresa May in which her best idea, quite a good idea, is to focus the honour system on local heroes, ordinary people, rather than overpaid TV celebrities. Sunday Telegraph, Sunday Express rather, Pippa. Shh. Mail on Sunday, Pippa and politics, and Pippa and Pippa, pages and pages of Pippa, he said, alliterating wildly inside. And then, oh, no, it's not Pippa, is it? No, in the Observer, and a, again, more politics on the school meals plan. So lots to talk about. Probably we'll talk more about politics than Pippa, I suspect. I think Amanda so. Platell. I think so, Andrew. Well, you're quite right. It was a, a very wobbly um, weekend for Theresa May and the Tories. I think that Jeremy Corbyn, when he heard the manifesto, he must have just thought, Alleluia. There is a God, even though he doesn't believe in one. Uh, it's just incredible. Nine, there's no, now only a nine-point difference in the polls. And that's the crucial figure this on, is the, the, crucial on the figure. Sunday and Times. In the Sunday Times, 44 to 35. And, you know, it's still a very respectable lead. It's not, you know, it's not going to make them be um, terribly worried, although obviously some um, candidates will. But I think the most important thing here really is, did she do this? Is, was this a mistake? Or was this intentional? Did she think, I can afford to lose some, I'm, an intent I'm a really principled Prime Minister? I mean, who knows? So do we, do we agree, Miranda, that the essence of the problem is what she said about social care, pensioners and probably the winter fuel payments? Well, I think the social care plan, certainly, and other sort of attacks on the elderly, as many of the papers have it today, were what you know, yes, Prime Minister would have called a brave <laughs> suggestion. But it is brave in a sense. There is a really big Absolutely. national problem and here is an answer to it. People may not like it, but there, it is a proper answer. Absolutely. And I think there's also a, a genuine political reason for having such an ambitious and risky manifesto, which is, of course, even if they win big in the Commons, the Tories don't control the House of Lords. They have mm. no majority. Mm. And the tradition is you don't block measures that are in a manifesto. Cause it, so if you want to do very so controversial things... this gives her things, much more power post-election by taking a hit now, then she can have more power later yes, on. Yes, but I think she is taking a hit. Yeah, fewer MPs, so that gives her less power. And, and, you know, there are very interesting quotes in that story about the poll on the Sunday Times saying we have to get the conversation off the yeah. manifesto. That's quite an interesting problem to have three weeks away from polling day. <laughs> Just before we move to Paul, the interview in, in the Telegraph, how much does that tell us, Miranda? Well, I mean, no disrespect to the journalist when I say there's very little in it, because she is the absolute mistress of saying nothing in her interviews. But I'm, I think this is a good example of what the election campaign was supposed to be like. I mean, you know, the Linton-Crosby method for winning elections is to have one slogan, Strong, yes, one idea, yeah. and stick to it. It's kind of no deviation, but lots of repetition. Um, yes. And she's back to that with her Sunday Telegraph interview. But unfortunately, the manifesto has disrupted the election. Well, if, if the idea, Paul, is to move the story on from social care, it hasn't worked very well in terms of the front pages. You've got the Mail on Sunday, the <laughs> dementia tax backlash. Well, you know, Labour spin doctors on the day of the Tory manifesto were actually discussing, do you think the word dementia tax might play? <laughs> it's there on the front page of the most Tory supporting newspaper. Look, Theresa May stood up twice in Downing Street and said, this election is about Brexit and Brexit only, mm -hmm. and to Labour voters in Yorkshire and Nottinghamshire, just lend me your votes on Brexit and everything else will be more or less the same. They wake up. I mean, every family in the land now wakes up worrying whether or not the asset wealth, the house price that's been assembled over generations for many working class families and middle class families, is now at a stroke, at risk, because, because mm. Theresa May does what? She pulls out of nowhere a, 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 a solution precisely opposite to the one recommended by the guy employed by ex the government to grow up one. Except, Paul, if you're in a, if you're in a Labour constituency in the north of England in a house worth less than £100,000, there's a lot of people in that position, this mm. is very good news for you because you don't have to pay a penny. Uh, well, absolutely. But the problem is, it's about universalism versus you're on your own. And the message that comes not just from this one, but from the all, almost every policy the Tory, rep, Tories presented in that manifesto was a reversal out of Cameronism, which, I mean, whatever you think about Cameron and Osborne, they did try to spread the load between the classes um, of, of paying for the big strategic problems like healthcare, like, like dementia, like elderly care. And this basically says to every family, you're on your own.
And no more a, pulling of the risk. The, 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 mm -hmm. It's, it's anti-universal, and it's a theme that I think is already pro pro provoking a backlash on, on, the, on the doorsteps. You know, on the doorsteps, last Sunday when I was out campaigning, nobody wants to talk about Brexit already. They just want to talk about what's the future for me and my kids. I found that quite shocking, having been in this bubble for a while. Mm, yeah. But this Sunday, my goodness, we know what they're going to be talking and, about. And what we have to remind ourselves, Miranda, is that the last election, not that long ago, 2015, <laughs> the Conservatives were talking about the Dilnot proposal, which oh. was a, a cap on social care of £72,000 and the rest of the risk pooled between everybody. Uh, that's right, and now they're talking about the completely the opposite, which is a sort of floor of 100,000, which is not very much if you're anywhere near the south of England, certainly. But I think if they stick to this policy, and it's questionable whether they'll be able to if they get rebellion from their own people as well inside the Tory party, is whether after the election they actually have to raise that 100,000 so but, much that it turns into a slightly different it's, policy. It's so complex. Um, that that's why it just was an open door to a label like the dementia, um, you know, the yeah. dementia yeah, that's a problem. It, it's a, it's you know, a big... And um, there's a lot of fear there. It's a no. big problem let's, three, let's, three days away from Let's calling. move, if we may, to the other side of the fence, yes. to Jeremy Corbyn in the Daily Mirror. Just tell us about that, Well, Amanda. it's quite interesting, because a lot of people are commenting on the fact that, um, that he may now be, um, he's much more aggressive, a full frontal personal attack on, on May. Uh, and and he even, he's even saying here that, you know, taking away the, um, the winter fuel allowance, it could cause lead to deaths, and that Theresa May is just going to leave a lot of... She's, she's, she's just being nasty. What he's just... Basically, the, the message is... Party. she It's now full-on. She's still a nasty party. And it's really interesting because he's clearly a man, visibly doesn't enjoy no, I... running the Labour Party as a mechanism. He doesn't enjoy that kind of job. He loves campaigning. Mm. He's in his element. And it's interesting, Paul, around the country we're seeing lots and lots of examples of big enthusiastic crowds. You've seen some. They don't appear on the traditional media very much. Though we're going to show you one, which is a Labour Party video, I have to warn people, from Yikes. Tranmere Rovers. <laughs> Here's Tranmere, and it's in the Tranmere Rovers ground. It's a music festival, I think. Oh, Jeremy Corbyn, a bit surreal. The real question is, does that make any real difference in the end to the polls? They get a lot of overexcitement this weekend, but actually, again, the polls are still suggesting a very, very large Tory majority, and a lot of people out there, not in Tranmere Rovers grounds, singing, hello, Jeremy Corbyn, don't like him. Well, look, um, many people who support Labour naturally have been feeling un treated unfairly. Because British people are quite fair, you know, I mean, it's one of the things that defines us as, as a nation, that we don't like to see people bullied and kicked unfairly, which is what's been happening to Corbyn and the media. And I would, I'm not surprised by that. I move in, in, among people who would have been in that crowd. Yeah. Um, but a lot of media people don't. And they will be, I think, I hope, shocked to see that, because that was an unplanned uh, meeting. Uh, Corbyn had just been on uh, West Kirby Beach, with a crowd that was so long that he couldn't see the back of it. Now, that doesn't win you an election. But what it does is it gives people on the doorstep the confidence to understand we are not a bunch of Al-Qaeda, IRA-supporting threats to national security, as all these mm. newspapers would have well, it. We are just the ordinary core of the British working population. And you've got, there's a story in The Observer there about media bias, I see. That's <laughs> yeah, but you've got to remember that the, the, one of the papers that didn't even put um, the, his manifesto on its front page was the Daily Mirror. You know? Was it, yeah, I mean, look, look. The, I mean, I think so the Daily Mirror has been quite. Well, I, I, no, absolutely. Look, this article in the Observer about media bias is a little bit of a sort of um, non-Damascene conversion from a newspaper that just does not like Jeremy Corbyn. It's not the bias that's the problem. When all okay. the newspapers are owned by billionaires who avoid tax, um, they're going to be anti-labour. It's the unfairness of the of the attack and the content of it that I think many people are now getting sick of. Miranda, I think you've been looking at Simon Heffer in the Sunday Telegraph. Yes, on the same I have. Theme. So to, to, well, to stay on the Labour Party, um, Simon Heffer has written a column about some of these whisperings that uh, Tony Blair behind the scenes might be gathering together money and supporters f f for, for something to happen after polling day. And it's this idea that the moderates within the Labour Party might still want to either split away or organise internally for any sort of leadership election that might come up. So it's a reminder that after polling day, the turmoil in the opposition you is could, not going to end. You could so argue if anyone that thought politics we took time off. Sorry. 
you could argue that politics generally gets more exciting on the day after polling <laughs> than in the run-up to polling. Though I shouldn't be saying that now. Keep watching, everyone. Well, indeed, so that's um, a sign of and it. And that's partly because, of course, the Conservatives, if they win again, have a very, very difficult yeah. job immediately on negotiating Brexit. And there are two very different interviews in terms of tone in today's book. One interview, one, one column. Um, David Davis, who is the Brexit secretary, is giving a very tough interview to the Observer. Yeah, he's just saying um, if they mess around with us, if they d demand a huge 100 billion or more than that divorce bill, he's just getting up and walking out. And I, I love the picture of it. I mean, you know, that that's. Look at it. He looks that like he's he's ready for a fight. He's yeah. right down there. You're not a man spread these days, are you? We should all <laughs> that avoid is a this. Big yeah. man spread. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so he's being extremely tough. But interestingly, there's a very different tone in an article by Boris Johnson in the Mail on Sunday, in which he, he attacks Jeremy Corbyn for being a blamange, not his best metaphor, Boris. Interesting, but not your best one. But he also says we want a very good deal with our European friends. We want a trade deal. He sounds much more emollient. And whether, we, whether the government goes a bit more Boris or goes a bit more David Davis is the real unknown question of the I general think, election. I well, think this Bruce is going to win. And, and, and also, interestingly, going back to our conversation about how, how the election's going, he, David Davis is trying to get them back on message as well yeah. with all this Brexit is the defining issue, the thing they seem to have disastrously yeah. forgotten for the yeah. last few yeah. days. And if it is the defining issue for them, if they can get back onto that, it's much better for the Conservative Party. And the words that we haven't mentioned so far are Liberal Democrat. What has happened to the great Lib Dem revival on the back of the 48% Remain vote? Everyone's saying it's going to be really their year, and so far they're low in the polls and falling. Tim Farron there in the Mail on Sunday, I think, are getting very fiery and angry. Yes, well, I think it's, it's become the most binary choice election for quite some time, um, and that means that what normally happens to the Lib Dems, which is a bit of a boost in coverage, followed by a squeeze in the last days, all they're having at the moment is a squeeze, mm. and they can't, they can't get into the conversation. And this decision to go wholly on Brexit uh, hasn't worked well for them. So interestingly, this interview with Farron is following up on the great opportunity provided by the Tory manifesto, which is to start talking about but domestic maybe, issues, maybe. and as may as, may as uncaring, <laughs> which plays into this you well, know, Paul's theory. We think ahead on this programme. We plan things very carefully ahead. And the reason we've asked Paul onto the sofa, of course, is to talk about the Pippa Middleton wedding, which we know <laughs> enthused no, him more than anything else. No, this is, this is, I mean, it's eight pages in the sun, eight pages in the it's mail, fantastic. a lot in the mirror. Um, you know, there's, the, there's a member of the young member of the royal family there with, with, with a, uh, uh, an outfit that every working class person in, in Britain will <laughs> occur, you know, understand. See, when people talk about um, certain politicians taking us back to the past, this, I'm afraid, <laughs> is uh, the, the, it's Downton Abbey, isn't it? Replayed with real people. But everyone but, likes Downton Abbey. That's well, the I point. Love, no, I love this because it's just eight pages of the kind of people who are going to be paying 50p on their tax when Labour get into power. And by the look of it, they could afford it. <laughs> All right, Amanda. It's just incredible. I mean, she's the sister of, of, of a, a royal. She's not royal in herself. But I guess there's a tradition of this, because Diana's brother sold all his, um, he sold his wedding to Hello. It's all about the I think pages. he sold all three of his it's weddings to Not the pages in the paper, but the pages it's, in yeah. the it's, tool, it's the just, knickerbockers. You know, and it cheers people up. If you've, you know, everyone well, likes a wedding. Cute I'm, kids. I'm glad you're all cheered up. Thank you very much <laughs> indeed for that. Let's have a look at what's on the front pages this morning. The Mail on Sunday says the Conservatives' lead in the polls had been cut after the announcement of their plans for social care. The Sunday Times also has a new poll. They say the Tories' lead is down to single figures. And the fallout from the manifesto is also in The Observer, which says almost a million children will lose access to free school lunches under the Conservatives. The Sunday Telegraph has an interview with Theresa May, where she says the honours system needs tightening up. The Sunday Mirror says people in Rochdale are worried about a convicted sex gang being back in their community. And The Sun on Sunday leads on Pippa Middleton's wedding yesterday also the lead in the Sunday Express. Well, to talk about all of that and plenty more, we're joined now by The Economist, Linda Yu, the broadcaster and former Conservative MP, Giles Brandreth, and the deputy editor of The New Statesman, Helen Lewis. Hello, thank you very much for being here. Good morning. In the midst of the election campaign, lots to chat about, <laughs> as usual. And it feels that like there's been a little bit of a twist in the narrative that we've been used to so far, polls tightening. Mm. Helen, do you think the Conservatives could be in trouble? 
Uh, no, I think, it's, I think you know when we're at the stage where we're saying Labour are only nine points behind. I think I wouldn't put the, you know the bunting out just yet for Labour. But I think it's been really interesting to see how big a reaction there has been to, to the social care policy. I'm not entirely sure the Tories really thought this was going to be the thing, the one thing that came out of their manifesto launch. And actually, they haven't really had a lot of people out defending it so far, which has been really interesting. The way that that phrase dementia tax has really been allowed to stick. And, you know, this is a proposal that's kind of bits of it is stolen from what Andy Burnham was proposing a couple of years ago when George Osborne immediately attacked it as a death tax. You know, these things are very controversial. And we'd all agree that this is something that really needs tackling. But it's something that's a very brave thing for the Conservatives to look in the face and say, people are going to have to pay a lot more money for their care. It's bad news for the Conservatives, I think, that the phrase dementia tax has taken root so quickly. In front, or the front of the Mail on Sunday, isn't on it? On the Mail on Sunday of all tax. places, there are echoes of the poll tax. Is this, you know, the dementia tax, is it going to be abandoned? In fairness, I recall when I was an MP, one of the things people always complained about, no long-term thinking, you're just looking to the next election. Here you've got a Prime Minister who clearly feels she is likely to win and therefore is at least addressing a complicated issue that others refuse to address in a serious way. How it plays out, we shall see. There may be advantages to the Conservatives in it being seen as scary Sunday, wobbly Sunday. Oh, because then we'll galvanise the activists to thinking, well, maybe it isn't a done deal. Maybe we really have got to get out and fight for this one. So this wobble actually could go down quite well. I mean, the Sunday Times, for example, has got that Tory wobble on the front page as cuts for the elderly slash May's lead. I mean, it... Look, they're still quite, as you say, Helen, they're still quite a long way ahead. We shouldn't perhaps get too carried away. But maybe this is good news, good timing for them. Well, I think it'll help get out the vote. I think the last election we saw the shy Tories, <laughs> if, they, if, if turnout increases, it may well help them. But I think I agree with Giles that it's actually brought out a bigger long-term issue that they had a problem addressing in the budget, you recall, just a couple of um, months ago. Well, the, um, and social care is a crisis which is brewing, and they were going to put in a long-term study about how to finance it. And there was some emergency money allocated just a little short while ago, but it isn't something that's going to be solved overnight. And I think one of the problems with this policy is that it is forward-looking, but does she have enough buy-in from her own party that you get the sense that it will actually happen? And I think that, plus the free lunches, of course, these are things that are hitting uh, poll numbers now. But perhaps it's good as it's hitting it now, and not a week before before the general election when there's less time to perhaps turn it around and they could find a few more defenders, as Helen says, to come out for this policy. But I think it's very difficult for her to back away from it. I mean, people are already saying, well, you know, they'll have to, to ditch this. But the whole reason that Theresa May called this election was because of, I think, really, the budget when they tried to get those national insurance re races. They were in the 2015 uh, Tory manifesto said, no, we won't increase national insurance. And that was seen, you know, she really felt that was binding her hands. So this was about getting her own mandate. And I think the trouble is if she gets her own mandate with these proposals through and then abandon them, then it does make the whole election feel like a huge waste of time. <laughs> yes, I always think it's a bit dangerous to put too much into your manifesto. You know, <laughs> the broad brush approach is really a safer bet because these things come back to bite you in the future. So maybe the social care, some of these unpopular policies, don't mention it in the manifesto, just do it in a few uh, times. And I think the promise is for a green paper investigating all of this. Mm. So <sighs> that between now and delivery, there's going to be a lot of discussion. <laughs> Uh, let's move on, uh, shall we? Uh, David Davis has given an interview in the Sunday Times. Uh, he's basically saying that unless the EU gives ground on this divorce bill, then they're prepared to walk away. Linda, what do you think? Is this a good negotiating tactic or does it worry you, this talk of walking away without a deal? <laughs> I think it is a negotiating tactic, but I'm not sure it's absolutely the right one. So in other words, a lot of negotiation actually comes down to goodwill. But of course, that being said, both sides have been posturing, essentially setting up to bring their own voters along. This is my position, and if I have to compromise, this is my starting point. And I think what's interesting about this Brexit bill is that um, Theresa May, the Prime Minister, has also come out to say that not only are they going to debate the amount of the bill, she actually wants what Britain contributes to the European Investment Bank, which is about 10 billion euros to count um, as part of the assets. And so I think this issue, and its senior uh, EU officials are quoted in that story saying that this actually raises the prospect of no deal, that we walk away with no deal above 50%. It is quite a big issue. But I would also say there's division within the European Union itself because the European negotiator, Michel Barnier, has said the problem is that 27 member EU countries do not want to up their own negotiations, so they want the UK to keep paying. 
and they don't want to take less in terms of their own project financing. So you have to square the circle somehow, and why not put it on the country, which is actually leaving? That's interesting stuff, certainly. I know David Davis quite well, and he's a nice guy, tough cookie, and not a fool. And during an election campaign, what else is he going to say in an interview with a newspaper? He is certainly not going to accept that a hundred billion dollar pound bill is going to be accepted by the British people. And if you are negotiating, unless you are ready to walk away, there is no negotiation. Otherwise, you're just conceding right at the beginning. And I also do think that's something that is playing very well for the Tories on the doorsteps. That kind of soft nationalism of we're standing up to the you know, EU bullies is something that motivates a, a lot of people. One of the big problems, you are just talking to Tim Farron there, the Lib Dems are having, is that there isn't this kind of great engine of outrage from people who voted Remain. Actually, it looks like pretty much half of the people who, who did vote Remain are what um, I think Marcus Robertson, you go, is called relievers. So they're, they, you know, they voted Remain, but now they're fine. They think we should just get on with it. Is that because they're sick of talking about the EU? Yeah. Can't face the idea of another referendum. Exactly. Today. I'm a reliever. You know, <laughs> I, I voted Remain. This is where it's going to be. On we go. <laughs> Release. <Accepted it. laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. We've accepted it. Live in the real world. <laughs> Except not quite the real world, because what I've chosen as my story yes. takes us <laughs> back to the future. I was leafing through the mail on Sunday just to sort of avoid Pippa for a moment. I thought, oh, there's a page without Pippa. And here it is. Tony Blair is back. And he's been itching to come back for months now. He clearly would like to be in the game again. I think he really would like to be a member of parliament again. He'd like to lead the Labour Party again. And he's beginning to raise finance for a future Labour Party. He's found an old friend, chairman of Hull City, uh, and he's talking to him about raising money for the post-election New Labour Reborn. Yep. NLR. That's what the party's going to be called. NLR. NLR. Helen, does this bring you out in a cold sweat, or are you quite delighted about the thought of this? I, do you know what? I, I have a, what is now quite a controversial view on people on the left, which is that Tony Blair has got a big contribution to make. He's always been a really interesting thinker. He's always been a great talker. And there is actually a space in British politics for this. You see where the way that Theresa May has moved the Tory party. Well, actually, who is speaking really for liberal Britain, for people who don't think that immigration is too bad, for people who do think that there are huge benefits to great levels of cooperation with Europe. There is that space for him, but the problem is he is still incredibly widely disliked. If you put him against Jeremy Corbyn, who is not a very popular Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn is more popular than, than Tony Blair. So I don't think he's uh, have a sort of Frank Sinatra-like return to lead the Labour Party again. But still, they're they're emboldened by uh, Emmanuel Macron's win in France because Emmanuel Macron formed his own yeah. party. He left the Socialist Party, which was very, very unpopular. He's claimed the central ground exactly on some of those issues that you described. He's very pro-globalisation, pro-centrist, yeah. pro-Europe, and maybe Tony Blair yeah, looking right. across the, um, you know, says very could do it too. Better. Tony Blair's got a wife his own age. Yeah. I mean, my gosh, he's got it all. <laughs> on that note, <laughs> we'll have to leave it there. Thanks very much for your thoughts uh, on the stories in today's newspapers. So, it was a week we learned all about them. Well, supposedly. He launched the most left-wing Labour manifesto in more than 30 years, but somehow forgot to promise to unfreeze benefit payments to reverse the government austerity cut that's currently widening the gap between rich and poor more than anything else. She, too, launched the most left-wing Tory manifesto probably ever and claimed that her party abhors social division, injustice, unfairness and inequality, but again said nothing about making benefit payments to low-income workers more generous. Only he pledged to spend billions on thawing the big benefits freeze, but he didn't make much of it because all he seemed to care about was giving us a vote to keep us in the European Union. As for him, his big idea is that all women should be called Natalie. Well, I suppose that's another form of egalitarianism. So, of course, I'm Natalie. Are you, Anushka, Screeny? We are all Natalie now. Well apart from Theresa, who is waking up to some pretty difficult headlines this morning. Look at the Mail on Sunday. They are borrowing the language of Jeremy Corbyn, calling that social care policy a dementia tax. Now, some Tory MPs are unhappy about it, and they have been talking to the Sunday Times that leads on the backlash to that policy, saying that it has tightened the polls. They call it a Tory wobble, and they have one Tory minister saying Theresa May is getting carried away with the idea of a landslide, although she insists that is not the case. She says if she loses just six seats, then Jeremy Corbyn will be taking charge 
of Brexit. Now, Labour are talking about the numbers too. Some say that Jeremy Corbyn will have been successful if he improves on Ed Miliband's 30% share of the vote. The shadow Brexit secretary, Keir Starmer, disagrees. He told my paper, The Guardian, that would not be good enough, that it's all about seats. Now, this chart shows you both those things. It shows you the number of seats Labour won at each election, and that white line there shows you their vote share. They tend to track together, but not always, and significantly not here. In 2015, Labour's vote share went up, but it lost seats and the Tories won a majority. Now, if that Sunday Times poll is to be believed, this white line would go up again for Labour, but it would lose more seats and the Tories would secure a majority of 46. Robert. So I'm delighted to be joined by two of Parliament's most flamboyant personalities, Labour's Jess Phillips and the Tories' Nicholas Soames. And um, I was delighted to see you out this week, Nicholas campaigning in what we might call the traditional way. <laughs> well, I was, um, I've got a large um, part of my constituency, which is a real rural area. And, and, and by far the best way to contact people is from, from a horse. And they can probably hear you coming, clip-clopping down the road. Do they run and away and hide? Or they... they vote. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, I want to talk to you about um, where we are in the campaign. Um, Nicholas, obviously, the tax, or I should, I should rephrase that, the new approach that the Prime Minister unveiled to social care, where everybody has to pay towards it up to your last £100,000. A lot of people don't like this. Uh, when I talk to MPs, they say it is being raised a lot on the doorstep. Older people in particular are very anxious about what this means for their savings and their ability to pass on property, for example, to their children. How worried are you that this is damaging your core vote? Well, first of all, um, everyone knows we can't allow it to go on as it is. The social care system? The social care system. Secondly, there is not a member of parliament in the land who doesn't have a great deal of time having to deal with problems related to social care and the affordability of it. Mm. Thirdly... I mean, the... in your constituency, I mean, a lot of people will have properties worth considerably more than They that. will. And, and, um, but the other point is, um, Robert, that there are going to be two million more people over the next ten years who are going to be over 75 years old. It doesn't exist. The option to do nothing doesn't exist. And I is this, this the right is, policy for this you? This is the right policy, but I think it's a start. And there is a long way to go to get it right. And, of course, people are going to be anxious about it because it's quite a fundamental change. But it's not one that can be left. And I think the Prime Minister is quite right to deal with it. So, just to be clear, if there's a long way to, to go to get it right, you obviously don't think this is the solution? No, I think that the whole social care funding structure in this country is very complicated and difficult and is going to need a great deal of care and attention over the next ten years, is of which this is a, a significant step forward. It, is £100,000 the right level to set, in a sense, the element that you can keep? Well, I think it's the right level because um, I, I think you have to have a, a, a cut-off point which is seen to be fair and reasonable. And I, I would just make one other point. And you think that is fair and reasonable? I think it is, but I don't, I don't have an old person who comes to see me who doesn't worry about the young people and whether or not they're going to get fair shares. And I think older people do know that they have been very well treated actually, by and large, and it is time that we is, had a regard... Is this benefiting to... Labour, this policy, do you think? I think it probably will do, yeah. Um, is I it mean, being raised I'm... when you're out campaigning? Yeah, Are people I'm... mentioning it to you? I'm hearing it on the doorsteps already. A 95-year-old veteran said to me yesterday, and this, funnily enough, it won't even affect him. He's, he lives in a council house, um, so it's, it's not like he has property to lose, but he said it, he feels that the government, and he felt it before, but this is the nail in the coffin, that they, they, they want him dead, that they feel that he's a... So so it's about respect for older people, yeah, you that, think? He, that older people are a burden and they're sort of being blamed for getting old. Um, so that is definitely coming up. The, the, the thing that keeps coming up as well is the disparity between if you get cancer and if you get dementia. That and that's certainly something that people mention to say, no, say, say me all the time, that people true. feel that it's somehow unfair this is not a that you refined get free system. healthcare treatment this is not a refined system. if it's anything apart from dementia. No, this is not a refined system. We're going to have to work out the details. But it is a step forward and the option to do nothing doesn't exist and there is a real problem on intergenerational fairness in this country well, where young people really do are beginning to get the rough end of the stick except that the, the conservatives <laughs> could like, pay more, more, I've, got to, I've got to cut you off